everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, May 26th, 2019. Today is the 11 year YNR chat anniversary. It's our chatterversary! Can you believe that? 11 years. May 26th. 2008, I uploaded the very first YNR chat video to YouTube. Today, this makes number 665 of all of the videos on YouTube. Also, this makes episode number 447 of the podcast, which actually I started publishing two years, or almost two years later on December 15th, 2010. So, wow! I think that's a pretty good milestone. I just wanted to start out by celebrating that a little bit and thanking you guys for being here and coming along with me on my little journey. Since Ray is driving the bookmobile this week, I'm thinking that maybe Ray might be able to hand out a copy of How to Win Friends and Influence People to Nick, Victoria, and Adam, <laughs> because they all three need it. Immediately upon finding out that their brother was alive, miraculously resurrected from the dead, <laughs> Nick just got all paranoid about Christian, and Victoria just got all paranoid about her job. And if Adam's memory was magically restored by the shock of being shot last week, then why didn't his temperament return to the Adam that he was? right before the cabin explosion? Because before the cabin explosion, Adam had made amends with a lot of the people in his life. Adam had asked Nick to raise Connor, to be the male father figure in Connor, his other son's life. And now this week, Adam is blackmailing Nick for custody of Christian, his other son, and he's wanting to add to that $500 million and Chelsea's digits. <laughs> this is what Adam wants. These are the three demands that he has made of Victoria and Nick this week. He wants Christian, he wants $500 million, and he wants Chelsea's digits. I, I am so flummoxed about this new Adam. I gotta tell you guys, I don't trust this new Adam. And trust is really, really key to getting me to care about a character. Because if you don't trust and care about a character, all you have is a one-dimensional villain, and they tend to come and go on the show all the time. I want to care about Adam. I want to feel connected to Adam. I want to understand him. 77% of you, by the way, voted in our poll last week that you wanted to give new Adam a big ol' thumbs down. I will say, the majority of the comments that I saw people were giving Adam a big thumbs up. So there are a lot of people who really like this new version of Adam, and I don't want to step on that at all. I mean, I'm happy to hear that there are people who've already like instantly connected with new Adam. And I feel like I will get used to the new actor, Mark Grossman, but the story just feels off to me. Because to me, the character of Adam was appealing because he was a loner and a rebel and he did a lot of bad things, but I almost always understood him, probably with the exception of Chris 
Angan's version of Adam, the original aged Adam. I had some trouble connecting in there because he was just doing bad things. They didn't feel totally motivated, but when they recast him and brought us Mooney, I, I always was able to connect in with Adam and that he had some kind of larger emotional purpose for doing the bad things that he was doing and that made me forgive his flaws. This Adam just seems cold-blooded. I'm getting all of the manipulation that Adam is capable of, but I'm just not getting any heart. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what he wants. I don't know what his plans are, and his plans seemed to change midweek. So not only do I not know what the original plan was, but now I don't know what the new plan is. Is all that Adam wants it to, is it to torture Nick and Victoria? Is that the new plan? Is he just trying to torture Nick and Victoria? Because why bother? I mean, Nick and Victoria, they're no match for him. Even combined, they're not really a match for Adam. It's, it would be like shooting fish in a barrel for him. What is the point? And why point? all of the vitriol in Nick and Victoria's direction when Nick and Victoria are just being their normal, selfish, spoiled selves in a way. I mean, that's nothing new. Why go after them but let Victor off the hook? Victor is the one Adam should be coming for unless that is part of the larger plan and we just don't know it yet. Victor is the one who Adam should be blaming, Victor is the one who Adam should be blackmailing. The thing that I think made me most question Adam's motives and his heart and who this guy really is, is the fact that he seems to have turned on the one person in this town who was purely and innocently trying to help him. Sharon discovers Adam shot lying on the floor, bleeding to death. <laughs> there was that really irritating hallelujah music playing in the background. I hate that. I feel like that is a function of this new regime that because they played out that whole hallelujah BS through the whole Delia thing and now they're back and all of a sudden out of nowhere I'm hearing a whole lot of hallelujah no thank you I hate that music I hate that vibe it is revolting to me I need it to stop I'll give you one hallelujah but that is it <laughs> we need to pull it back now um I I I, I don't understand Sharon saved Adam's life she called 911. Adams rushed to the hospital. He's lying there. Victor rushes to his bedside, gives him the whole Newman men are fighters. You're a Newman. You can you better fight. He gives him the the punchy fist. You know, you got to fight through this punchy fist. And then boom, uh Adam wakes up, recognizes Victor, calls him dad, and all is forgiven. That cannot be. All is forgiven with Victor, but Nick and Victoria are the enemies? I, I, it's, it's Victor who perpetuates this rivalry between his children. It is Victor's fault that the family does not get along, and yet he stands there scolding uh, his other children for being jealous of Adam. Well, yeah, it's because you make them that way. Victor never takes a moment to realize that maybe the problem is him. Maybe he's the problem. <sighs> well, while um, Adam is still in the hospital, Sharon brings Adam his phone that he's been making all these mystery text messages from. And Sharon is there supporting him. It seems like everything is really going well between him. I mean, they're stroking hands. She's stroking his hand. He's stroking her hand. They both seem to be really enjoying the stroke. And then when Sharon leaves, Adam comes off in the corner to use his corner of his bed to use his cell phone. He makes a phone call 
to somebody, or maybe it was a text message, I can't remember, but he basically says, yeah, I, no, I think it was a phone call. He says, yeah, I know who shot me. I saw him, I saw their face, even though he had already at this point told Paul that he had no clue who it was, but Adam tells the person on the phone that he knows who shot him and now he's gonna need a fall guy. We can't, we can't implicate whoever it was that actually shot him. We need a fall guy. And oh yeah, by the way, we also need to shut down the investigation. What the hell does that mean? What investigation? Who, is he working with someone? Does this have something to do with investigating Victor? Is he trying to get close to Victor to investigate him? Uh, but then he shut it down later in the week. So I don't get it. But no, nobody is wrong to not trust Adam. Paul didn't trust Adam, the Newmans doesn't trust to Ad, don't trust Adam, and they're right. But <laughs> I think they're going about this all wrong. They immediately always have to make Adam an enemy, and it just makes the situation worse. Did Victoria really need to get all insecure about her position at Newman Enterprises of all things? <sighs> She gets paranoid about her safety at the company and runs not really to Victor, but to Adam. She runs to Adam to ask what his plans are. Well, way to go, Victoria. All you did was just tip your hand to a professional poker player. Now Adam knows that she's in a position of weakness and that her position at Newman Enterprises is her sore spot and He's just gonna he's just gonna keep going at it and Victor's gonna have no problem letting Adam go at it Victor loves when his children are at war competing for his love and affection But I also think that Victor knows something that we don't know here because he's been having asides with Dr. Nate all through the week and also in the previews talking to Nate about some results asking Nate uh, try to help Adam get out of the hospital early and then in the previews Nate is coming to Victor saying that he's got some bad news and Victor says well we gotta fight it or change it or whatever. It, I think Adam is dying. I think Victor thinks that Adam is dying. I think the results are Adam's results and that they're gonna try to now say that there's something wrong with him and maybe Adam doesn't even know it yet. I, I, I can just, I don't know. I just see it. Nothing garners sympathy for a villain like a death scare. And uh, I, I mean, a, 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 another death scare. A different death scare. Not the one that we had last week, which nobody ever thought for the blink of an eye that Adam was gonna die after being shot. But I just wonder if they're gonna go some kind of medical route with Adam and say that he's got some disease and so we should all feel sorry for him and now we're back on board with him. I don't know. Well, Nate does uh, release Adam from the hospital and he even gives him a spare pair of scrubs. What was the point of that? <laughs> It was just weird seeing him walk around in scrubs. I mean, I guess the scrubs I get. The shoes were a surprise, though. The, the hospital happened to also have a pair of white, sensible tennis shoes <laughs> on hand. Seeing Adam Newman, <laughs> the, the Black Knight Jr., in a sensible white tennis shoe was just uncomfortable for me. <laughs> Didn't like it at all. But Adam gets back to the tech, the tech house and he's still text messaging back and forth with this mystery cohort. Who knows who it is? Adam tells the cops that, or he says, he says to the cops that he doesn't know who shot him, but then he turns around, tells the person in the text messages that the cops are suspicious of him but they have no leads because Paul had visited Adam in the hospital right before he got released for a second time and he showed Adam at Paul showed Adam the picture of a person who had turned themselves in for the crime and Adam said oh yeah I recognize this guy he must have shot me over a gambling debt or something but 
you know, Adam knows that he's not telling the truth, and Paul is suspicious that Adam's not telling the truth. Paul doesn't believe that a person flew all the way to Vegas to shoot Adam and then just conveniently turned himself in, and maybe that's paranoid, but Paul is also right. Adam was up to something, but I don't know now that we'll ever exactly know what it was. Adam says goodbye to this mystery cohort in a text message, tells the person that his plans have changed. So after two weeks with this new Adam, I I'm just still stuck with nothing but questions. I don't have any answers. I don't have any idea. What was the original plan? Who was the mystery person that he was texting with? Who found the fall guy? Who is the fall guy? Who actually shot Adam? And what is it that Adam really wants now? It feels like that Simpsons episode where they were revising the itchy and scratchy cartoon and they decided to bring on this new character named Poochie and they decided that well Poochie should always be on screen and if he's not on screen then all the other characters should be asking where's Poochie? I feel like Adam is Poochie right now. We are doing so much talking about him and yet I don't know anything about him. We see him all the time, don't know anything about him and it just is feeling a little obnoxious. All I can even glean about Adam at this point is that he wants to get close to Victor again while making Victoria and Nick squirm. Maybe the point is to make Victoria and Nick squirm while he enacts some kind of revenge on Victor. I don't know. Adam stopped by Victor's office to gaze at his father's <laughs> portrait saying, oh, I'm about to let you down, Pop. When has Adam ever called Victor Pop? That was weird. He's over there staring at Victor's picture right before he goes over to Nick's office <laughs> to issue this list of demands on Victoria and Nick. He had told him early in the week, I want to meet with you. And now he meets in Nick's office and he gives them a list of three demands. Okay, number one. Adam wants five hundred million dollars. <sighs> okay, sure, no problem. Personal check, okay? I'll just flip open my checkbook and write you that. What? 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 And what? What? Why? <laughs> why are they supposed to give you five hundred million dollars? <laughs> and why $500 million? Just because that was the amount that they won in their lawsuit against Victor? <laughs> I mean, Nick gave away his money, so Victoria is the only one who might have it, and Victoria is actually considering how she's gonna scrape that together? Are you freaking kidding me? And of course, like usual, Abby is just swept to the side. Abby also got 500 million in that lawsuit, but who cares about her? Her 500 million is safe. All right, I, I guess. <laughs> it's a good thing Abby got left out of this mess or she could be getting a little blackmail attempt of her own. Victoria is so stupid. She's just playing right into his hand. But Nick is, oh, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but it seems like Nick is the only one who's maybe being smart about it. Because number two, Adam's demand, is that he also wants custody of Christian. Just because, mm, uh, doesn't know the kid, never wanted him before, barely ever met him, went out of his way to make it look like it wasn't his kid, but now he wants him. Okay, I guess he just wants Christian because Christian has Adam blood and, you know, it's a Newman thing to do and probably he also just doesn't want Nick to have him. Okay, all right. <laughs> and then number three, and this one threw me a little bit for a loop because <laughs> Adam demands that Nick and Victoria help him find Chelsea. Hey, buddy, why don't, why don't you just do that yourself? What do you need them for? Why can't you just find Chelsea on your own, Mr. Resourceful? What makes Adam think that Nick even knows where to find Chelsea? And Nick, he does know how to find Chelsea, but I don't know why Nick is feeling 
the need to protect Chelsea. Like, uh, Chelsea broke off their engagement while Nick was sitting on the couch watching the game. She was like flying off to another country. And Chelsea also, I feel, would leap to the idea of being back together with Adam again. So why is Nick acting like he's protecting Chelsea by not giving Adam her contact info? Chelsea never got over Adam's death. She was never fully able to commit to Nick because of that. So what is the deal, new Adam? And why the 180 degree turnaround on Sharon? Sharon is the one who brought you home. She brought you your phone. She saved your life. And all, all of this within a couple of days time frame. Now he's just giving her the cold shoulder, telling her to just leave him alone. Well, fine then. Fine, new Adam. I don't want you and Sharon to hook up anyway. <laughs> when was the last time that you brought Faith a copy of Little Women? Hmm? Mia and Arturo say so long to Genoa City and it was all very neat and all very perfect and all very heartfelt and tearful. Ray and Arturo made amends. They had a handshake and a hug. Lola forgives Mia for what happened, you know, with the accidentally hospital wacky wacky. And Lola says, it's fine, I forgive you. Uh, just make sure I'm the first person you call when you go into labor. Or that's what Mia said. Like, yeah, right. Lola gonna be the first person you call when you go into labor. Uh-huh, thanks for the sentiment. <laughs> yeah, they they uh, they all promise to stay in touch and they turn on their heels and uh, walk out the coffee house door. I am glad that that door is still open for a possible return someday. I, I do think it's possible maybe after Mia has had the baby, she could return to town and maybe reveal that she fudged the paternity test results to make it look like Arturo was the father. Keep in mind, this is the woman who fudged her pregnancy test results. Maybe she did it again. Maybe she could come back to town someday and challenge Ray and Sharon's relationship. I don't know. You never know. I like that it's at least open. Probably not, but you know, a girl can help. Um, okay, well, as soon as Arturo and Mia are out the door, Ray decides to double down on Sharon. He files for divorce from Mia, moves in with Sharon. And believe it or not, I actually really loved the scenes between Ray and Faith and Sharon this week. And more so, I know I've been so critical. <laughs> so critical of Faith, not the actress. I mean, she's she's perfectly fine. It's just the way that Faith has always been written so precociously. But this week, Faith was phenomenal. I think Faith has grown into such a very mature young woman. And in all seriousness, I think it was awesome to see how much the actress has grown because we haven't seen her in a while. And it seemed like the last time we did see her, she was skipping around on the set in a backpack or something. And now here she is just being her own independent, unique person and I just saw her in a more mature way this week and I loved it. I loved Faith. Faith is savvy. <laughs> Faith did not pull any punches when it came to Ray. She has been down this road before with all of mommy's new boyfriends. Probably more times than she can even count. <laughs> but she, you know, and while she asserted that, she also was very open and welcoming with Ray. She gave him a chance. She never crashed his uh, drone into a tree, or maybe she did, maybe it was near. It looked like maybe it was a near miss, uh, but she gave him a chance. I liked to see him try, and I liked to see her give him the chance. Uh, and she was also so very mature with Sharon. Can you even imagine if Sharon was your mother? But, you know, Faith gave Sharon the space as Faith, ever the more mature one, gave Sharon the space that she needed to make the decision to just be happy with Ray at this point in her life and to go ahead and move in together. 
It was Faith who encouraged them to do it. I am a little bit nervous though, because when Faith was grilling Ray during the week, Faith did mention how much time her mom has been spending with Uncle Adam lately. And Ray brushed it off, but you know that comment was there for a reason. Seriously, you guys, I don't think I want Sharon and this Adam back together. So the fact that Adam shut Sharon down is probably a good thing for me and what I want to see for these characters. I was in love with Sharon and Ray this week. They've wanted to be together for such a long time. I mean, YNR did take the slow route in building that romance and f getting us here, finally getting us here. They've wanted to be together forever and I want to give them a chance to finally be happy because I think there is a lot of great chemistry there and I think that Ray is also a really great guy who Sharon deserves and needs I think at this point in her life. Ray is a family man. It's about time that Sharon started thinking about Faith. And Ray is a good pick to bring into the household. He always wanted kids. So he's great with kids. He's, he's great. He was excellent with Faith. I think he would be a, a wonderful role model for Faith. And whereas Adam, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd be too afraid that Adam would pull Sharon back into that dark place right as Sharon has finally got her life back on track. I do not want to see dark Sharon again. And uh, I don't know, Ray, I don't, I don't think that Ray is the gonna, kind of guy who's going to intentionally break Sharon's heart the way that so many other men have. Frankly, at this point, I am way more worried that Sharon is going to break Ray's heart because Adam <laughs> giving Sharon his cold shoulder might very well make Sharon want his hot affair. Kyle and Lola had a hot affair this week. Oh, I mean, they were smoking hot. These two were so hot, they were setting off the fire alarms. <laughs> Lola was cooking dinner for Kyle and they, they just started, they got too preoccupied with their smoochy smooch smoochin' that Lola forgot all about dinner. The fill, she filled the entire apartment up with smoke. They had to figure out how to put out the, 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 the smoky fire. Kyle didn't know what he was doing. You could tell Kyle was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was just, I don't know what to do. What's an oven? <laughs> he was just trying to fan it, fan it. Didn't know where to, how to turn the fire alarm off. <laughs> it's going to be fun to see Kyle live. You know, it's sort of funny because we usually have the fish out of water story with the person who doesn't have money going to try to succeed in the world of money. But here it's a little bit different because we're seeing Silver Spoon and Kyle trying to hack it in the real world, in a little apartment and all of the day to day things when you don't have a maid and a staff. So I think, I think this is fun. I like it a lot. And since Ray is moving in with Sharon, it fr freed up his place ever so conveniently for Lola and Kyle. It was a real, a little bit ridiculous though for me to believe that these two had such trouble finding any other apartment in Genoa City. They are both so totally loaded. I mean, Lola has got to be making good money at this point. She is the head chef at a successful restaurant. Kyle is a high level executive at Jabot. They could afford two bathrooms. <laughs> they do not need to have a one bathroom apartment. Two. Two is key. In fact, I, 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 this is a little piece of, of advice from me. The key to a successful relationship, any successful relationship, is having two bathrooms. It doesn't actually even have to be two baths, <laughs> just two toilets. That's all you need. Recipe for relationship success. Phyllis launches a website that will compete with Jabot Collective now. Phyllis 
is going to be selling similar products to Chabot, hoping to undercut them. She, her company has similar branding to Chabot Collective, so she's hoping people won't even notice that they're buying knockoffs. JCV is the name of Phyllis's company. J Jolie Chic Vision is what it stands for. Jolie Chic Vision. What does that name even mean? Who is Jolie? Did I miss that? Or did we just pull a name out of a hat here? What does that mean? And what happened to Good Karma? I thought that was a way better business name. Uh, I don't know. Phyllis is uh, on the war path. She is wanting this revenge no matter who she has to hurt to get it. Summer tried to deter Phyllis from doing something like this and really didn't like the fact that Summer wasn't jumping right on board to help her do it. I, I will say Phyllis did explain herself to Summer in a way this week that reminded me of why exactly she's so hell-bent on retribution. Phyllis feels that everything she did as CEO of Jabot that got her fired, everything having to do with Carrie and the patents, she felt that that was nowhere near as bad as any number of things that Billy and Jack had done, especially since when Billy was doing his bad things like gambling with the company funds, she was right there beside him supporting him. So Phyllis feels that her, because of her actions at Jabot, she got punished and she got blacklisted while Billy and Jack's worlds just keep going round. I think at this point, Phyllis, she has it in her head. Phyllis wants an eye for an eye, whether they all go blind or not. Lauren and Michael are the most adorable matchmaking team. And I loved Claire. They set Jack up with this new woman named Claire. I thought for sure that this actress was related to Tracy Bregman, who plays Lauren. Because the, when I, the first time I listened to this episode, I was only listening to it. It was on with the TV in the background, and I didn't see anyone's face. I was just hearing the audio play. And I kept hearing the flirty things that were coming out of this woman's mouth, and I thought it sounded so much like Lauren, the way that she spoke and just the cadence of it. It was so similar to Lauren's. I thought they were related. I had to go, I kept having to like walk back over to the TV and say, is this, is this Lauren in makeup? I honestly thought maybe Lauren was in makeup for this role. That's just how much they sounded alike. They just seemed so alike. But I looked it up, I couldn't find a thing um, about these two being related in any way. I, I really liked her though, I liked Claire. I mean, they hit, she hit it off with Jack. They seemed to be getting along very well. She invited him to a black Thai event and then out for Thai food later. Who knows, maybe even back to her condo later in her little, probably beautiful condo in Chicago. It all sounded very lovely. But Jack was clearly uncomfortable with the idea of dating again once he realized that he had been set up. He told Lauren, no, no I'm not gonna do this, sorry, I'm clipping your wings, and <laughs> Cupid. And Lauren was so friggin' adorable when she told Jack that he shouldn't rub all of the fabulous single women in the world of a fabulous single man like him. <laughs> I loved that. And Jack goes, oh, I'm still attracted to women. Don't get me wrong. That's never going to change. I'm just not interested in dating right now. Why, Jack? I mean, okay, I know you've had some bad luck, but you know, you can still go out and have a good time. Keep it light. That whole, it was just, ugh, I just enjoyed it. Michael, you know I love, he was so friggin' adorable. <laughs> He was so friggin' adorable, except for the hair. I mean, we might need to have a separate YNR chat to discuss what is going on with Michael's hair. It is not right. It looks like he is wearing a Michael hair helmet. 
I'm not opposed to it being longer, but it's too, it just looks like it is setting on his head. Like somebody just grabbed a head of hair and just like gently placed it on top of his head. Like it's just not sitting naturally. Something is weird. It's been weird for a little while and I didn't want to say it, but I'm bringing it up because I can't, and he's going to be on screen next week. And he needs a tight cut. Fine if you want to grow it a little bit longer, but for, it looks better if you have a tight cut around the sides. He's a lawyer. It's just, okay, hippie Michael. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's just, it's too poofy or something. You tell me if you've noticed anything weird about Michael's hair or if it's just me. He was so adorable nonetheless though when he came to Lauren and like first it was Jack and Lauren and Claire and Michael busts up into the meeting, pulls Lauren away from it in order to force Claire and Jack to be alone together. And just before Michael left, he whispers to the table and he says, oh, oh, try the, well, uh, try the langosta with avocado. It's yummy. <laughs> Oh my goodness. It was, I laughed out loud. That, that was so good. I mean, these were really funny scenes and a really fun use of two of my favies, Lauren and Michael. I have to hand it to YNR. I think they have listened to the fans who love Dina, who want the best for Dina but are also at the same time exhausted by not having a resolution or a follow-up on the Alzheimer's story. It's, it's just the fact, it's, it's not that she has Alzheimer's. I understand there is no turning around from this disease. It's just that they've written the character into a corner and they just can't keep doing the same old same old they have to resolve the story and i think that's what they're doing now the writers are showing us that dina has now deteriorated so badly that she doesn't even know where she is anymore and that that is terrifying for her that something needs to be done she can't continue on in a state of being terrified that's not fair to her so if Dina doesn't know where she is, then maybe it is time that they, the Abbots move her into a place where she can get better care by people who are trained to care for her. I think the story needs that. We can't just keep pretending that Dina's upstairs locked in the attic. They need to move it forward. And I can completely appreciate and admire the fact that the family had the determination to want to try to care for Dina themselves at home. A lot of people shove the elderly, shove their, their in quotes, loved ones into a care facility and then never visit them, never follow up with them, never take responsibility for them. So the, the Abbots should be commended for trying, absolutely. But I agree that for the family's sake, for the viewer's sake, if YNR is not gonna give us a misdiagnosis or a twist of some kind, then it is time to be realistic and get Dina the care that she need dead a year ago when she was burning down buildings. Mm. It is going to be a sad goodbye though. Uh, I just wish, I wish they'd do a twist. I mean, if we are making unbelievable leaps left and right in other stories, I wish they would just twist it and, and have a misdiagnosis or a twin or something, but I don't know. They're, at least they're doing something. It's gonna be hard to watch. Um, it's hard to watch her feeling afraid and lost, but I know that at least if she is in a long-term care facility, then the people there would be able to provide a more controlled environment than the Abbots have, um, and they are going to make sure that when situations arise where Dina feels afraid and lost, that they, those people are trained and have the tools to better manage those types of situations. Tracy is in the midst of her mother's tragedy while still in the midst of writing her book, which is turning into some steamy ideas for her. 
see, Tracy is just so real. Tracy is every real woman who is not represented on this show. She is not your typical romantic lead. She is older. She's carrying some of that extra weight. She's a do-gooder, not a vixen. And so I think it's refreshing just to watch her realizing that she is developing these feelings for Kane while Kane is at a point in his life where he's trying to develop a life that's more like Tracy's. Oh, this is the most exciting thing to me on the show right now. Kane had his first day at a new job. He's helping reacclimate a, a former inmate into the work environment, trying to, it, it, the, what he did was not well, remarkable, but the fact that he's doing it is admirable. Um, he was just sort of giving the guy tips for interviewing. And he's feeling very proud of himself, feeling good about himself, which is a heck of a lot better than feeling bad about himself, which is all he's been doing for months now. Kane goes to Tracy to celebrate, to catch up. They take a walk in the park, and in the middle of sitting on a bench talking, Tracy suddenly imagines Kane taking her hand and kissing her. To the G. In reality, I do think that he did take her hand. The way that it was shot, it wasn't immediately clear where the reality began and where the or where the reality ended and where the fantasy began. Which, by the way, is exactly what the appeal of this story is for me. Where does the reality end? Where does the fantasy begin? I love the blurred lines of it all. But when she snapped out of it, he did seem to be holding her hand. I think he, um, he did grab her hand and then she just imagined that it went into the kiss. But she, just, she snapped out of it right away and she just jumped up and ran away. She just ran away with him like, oh, oh sorry, I gotta go. <laughs> oh my goodness. I could just so totally understand that. I'm sure that Tracy feels a little silly maybe a little embarrassed for being friends and friendly with Kane while secretly kind of wanting to make out with them. But I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, you can't blame her, but I can see how she would just feel silly for being attracted to a, a man that's, you know, a man like Kane. But I'm in, I am so in <laughs> for Tracy and Kane. Are you in? We have been inching toward this maybe, maybe not relationship between Kane and Tracy for weeks now, and I have resisted the urge to make it a poll question, only because I wanted to wait to when the time was right. I wanted to give it a little bit more time, and then go in and test the waters and see what the YNR chatters are saying. So that is our poll question for this week. Are you up? for a Tracy and Kane romance. Can you dig it? Can you get down with it? Go to yrchat.com. Let me know if you are like in for a romance in a relationship or if you would just rather not. <laughs> Vote in the poll, leave me your comments. Can't wait to hear and read what you guys say. Next week we are going to have the reading of Neil's will. From the previews, it looks like everybody is there. Michael's there with his weird hair. Lily's there. Devon's there. Even Kane is there, interestingly. I, I wonder if that means that Neil considered Kane family and wanted to bequeath something to him independently. Um, even if he and Lily were not together, he wanted Kane to have something. Or, I don't know, is it possible that Kane is there on behalf of the minor children, Charlie and Maddie, since they're not 18 yet. I'm not sure. I'm not really looking forward to it. Neither is Devon. Michael had to track Devon down, even to get him to commit to a date 
to read the will. And it is completely understandable. Devon feels that the will is the last step. And once the will is read and the assets are distributed, it feels like he's closing a book on the very last chapter of his father's life, or he's closing the last chapter on the book of his father's life. But I mean, the book doesn't have to be closed. That's, I mean, I think that's a better way to look at it. The book doesn't have to close. It just doesn't have any new chapters. You know, you can always go back and, and read the book and, and re-enjoy enjoy the book. But I, I know that's easier said than done. And luckily, Devon will have Elena to help him write some new chapters in his own book. This week, Jet was kicking around the idea of going out on tour. And I'm wondering if that means that we're not going to be seeing very much more of him. Is Jet going off on the same No Man's Land tour that Fenn did? Is this YNR's way of saying, okay, he's going on tour, goodbye, we're not going to see him now. And I, I find that disappointing. I would have liked to have brought, I thought we were bringing Jet on as a main character. And yet, Winer's not really doing anything with him. Both, it, it seems like it's, the, the writing is on the wall in the book when it comes to Elena. She is in. She is there for Devon. But it seems like now Jet might be quietly going away. And I don't know what they're doing with Anna. We can talk about that in a minute. But it is my question. Um, is Jet going to be sticking around? Because if he's not going to have a love interest or a storyline, something to do, then the character doesn't serve much of a purpose. Oh, well, Elena, she, at the beginning of the week, was talking about how she doesn't want Jet to go on tour. She is worried about his health, but Jet assures her that he is fine to do so, which means that Elena is fine to stay in Genoa City. Subtext, Elena is fine to pursue her relationship with Devon full time. What is Anna's problem? When she first was on the show, she was such a sweet girl. And now, out of the blue, she is a barracuda. I don't like it. I don't like her. I don't like her tone. I don't like her attitude. And I don't like her style sense for Tessa. Are you kidding me? That rainbow paillette dress with an electric blue fur coat? Tessa looked like a space clown. She's a lesbian. That doesn't mean that she's a drag queen, Anna. <laughs> and the way Anna was so happy about it, it just felt like she's like forcing Tessa to be something that she's not. Why would you ever want to force anyone to be something that they're not? Especially not in a, a, a music career type situation. It is the exact opposite of what you want to do. There could never be career longevity by anyone if they are not connecting in with who they are and using that to funnel their work. All Anna is doing is dressing Tessa up like a space clown, reworking her song until it is unrecognizable, and it is embarrassing. I, I mean, like, it's embarrassing for Tessa, it's embarrassing for Anna, and for what? So that you can sell a bunch of records, make a bunch of money, and make Tessa a one-hit wonder? Forcing Tessa to be something that she's not is the clearest and fastest track to one-hit wonder. You're just taking away anything and everything she is. Get somebody else to be your space clown! <laughs> I mean, she said so herself. There's a million artists out there who would be happy for that opportunity. Well, why don't you go find one of them? If what you're looking for is that style, go find somebody that fits that style. <sighs> Minor did a good job of getting me on Tessa's side. Ooh, that, but, it, but I can't even look at Anna now. I'm so mad at her. Oh, well, Tessa... She, as you know, I, I always knew she had it in her to be a nice girl because with Mariah's encouragement, Tessa decides to put her foot down in the nicest possible way with Anna. Tells her, you know, I want to be open and honest about what I'm feeling and these just uh, doesn't feel like my song, doesn't feel like I can do this, this doesn't feel like me. And it, as the reward for being open and honest, Anna 
just brings down the hammer on Tessa and says, oh well, you don't like it, go somewhere else because it is either my way or the highway. And so Tessa just decided that I, I guess I have to take the highway. <laughs> Dang, it's, it's so unnecessarily aggressive. I don't understand it. What do you think that Devon would say about that, Anna? I mean, if these two personalities and people and styles could not work together, then surely Devon could have paired Tessa with another music producer that she could get along with a little better. Surely Hamilton Winters has more than one music producer above and beyond Anna. I am also wondering what Devon is going to say about and do about Mariah's stalker. Mariah is being stalked by a fan of the program that he owns. So I'm looking forward to Devon stepping in on this situation. It didn't turn out to be Anna. The stalker did not turn out to be Anna. Maybe Weiner just wanted us to think that. Um, it didn't turn out to be Elena that we know of so far. It just seems like Mariah Stalker is some random weirdo who thinks he has some kind of imaginary connection with Mariah, even though they never met. Well, I completely commend this storyline. I am surprised by how much I like it, but I think there is a real story here, a real message here, because celebrity stalking is a real thing. And it's so much easier these days with social media. I mean, you can tell where people are at any moment. So, I mean, I just think this is a story that I don't think YNR has ever told before. And it is very powerful and very relevant, especially today. I mean, when I think about celebrity stalking, I think back to this beautiful young woman named Rebecca Schaefer, who uh, was a young actress in the late 80s, and she was murdered, just murdered by this man who was stalking her. And she wasn't able to get help. He had been stalking for her for a while, uh, and he just, I, 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 he just murdered her. And I mean, ah. Uh, 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 can you imagine? And then there also, I remember there was a, a YouTube star, uh, I think it was just a few years ago, who was, she was gunned down in public by a, a, a man who was stalking her. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's just so many examples and it's so horrific. And I'm sure, honestly, that a lot of our YNR stars, our actors and actresses probably have to deal with shades of that, shades of stalking, because I mean, there is of course the extreme where the celebrity uh, is is murdered, but there are also so many other uh, points and steps before that where maybe it's harassing them on social media or you know just showing up. I mean, it doesn't always escalate to something horrific, but there's a, a lot in between that is really messed up, and uh, and yeah. I just, oh, I think this story has such such potential. Maybe you guys know some other examples uh, of celebrity stalking. I mean, I'm sure there are so many. I, I don't know how, about how the situation was handled, though. That guy seemed really out of touch with reality. When he confronted Mariah at Crimson Lights, he was talking so weird like he knew her and like she knew him that Mariah was stunned and scared. She was barely moving. She looked frozen. And then Tessa walks up right in the middle of it. Here's this guy, like almost like this weird love hate thing. Like he was talking about them having a connection, but, I, but he was also saying all these horrible things about her. And Tessa walks up it just speaks so much to that crazy mind. But Tessa walks up into the middle of it and she takes a photo of the guy, just grabs her phone, realizes this is the stalker, starts taking photo, 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 tells him that if he doesn't beat it, she's going to call the cops. And then he left and they kind of went about their business. I, I don't think that was the right move. 
I mean, it was wonderful seeing Tessa defending Mariah for a change, but I'm really worried that Tessa's reaction to him might have just angered the guy, maybe made it worse, maybe made her a target. Um, I'm not sure. I think, I think this could blow up. This could be really bad. This could get really sick, depending on how uh, YNR chooses to go with it. Or who knows, maybe YNR will just make the story go away and we'll never hear another thing about it. One or the other. Abby finally gives in to Dr. Nate. She accepts his invitation to go out on a date. Or actually, no, I think she ended up extending the invitation to him in the end. I mean, Abby has had such phenomenally bad luck with men that I think it would be nice to see her with a nice guy like Dr. Nate. But the thing is, we thought they were all were nice guys. She, she, Abby always thinks they're nice guys in the end. And it always turns out bad. I mean, I don't think she's ever had an actual relationship that stuck. Um, yeah, I mean, probably Arturo was the closest she's come in a long time. And, and look how that turned out. I don't know. I just kind of, I mean, Given the situation, I kind of wish that Nate and Abby were meeting and dating a couple of months down the road. I mean, Arturo just left town on Monday, and I don't know, I'm not sure that Abby's exactly going to be ready. I'm not sure I'm exactly going to be ready to have Dr. Nate dressing her wounds of all the great advice that I am able to take away from YNR. You're an original, be original, is one of my favorite quotes ever. Michael is the sage wise man who said that. He had several other good quotes this week too. The character of Michael is just so well written and he had another uh, quote, I don't remember it offhand this week, that I thought, oh, I wish I wouldn't have used Michael last week because I could use him again too this week. He's just so good. But a lot of people must be tuned in to Michael's every word because a lot of people guessed that Michael was our who said it quote of last week. It was Michael B. Shar, Jamie, Keisha, Sandra, Shakona, Heather, Janice, Tina Cole, Christy, Julie, Aaron, Tony, Justin, Ambreen, Daisy S, Henry, and Diana. You guys all guessed it right. Here's another little quote for ya. I'm super stubborn and can be a little annoying. <laughs> Every character has that amount of awareness about themselves. I mean, maybe you will, would agree. Maybe you heard it and agreed. Maybe you heard it and didn't agree. I'm super stubborn and can be a little annoying. Who said it? Go to yrchat.com to leave your guess. And if you get it right, I will give you your shout out on next week's YNR chat. All right, let's get down to your comments for the week. First of all, I have to acknowledge all of the comments and messages that I received when YNR chat was late last week. I am so sorry. Long story short, the internet was out last Sunday. I had just finished recording YNR chat, so everything was done. If the internet had gone out just a little bit later, everything would have been up. Nobody would have noticed but it did you know I mean things happen and I know that I am so regular with getting chat out on time I mean I I knew I'm sitting here knowing that I'm not posting my inner chat and I'm just waiting for the rescue helicopters to arrive I just felt that I felt that so many people were probably worried and concerned and I hated that I had to be incommunicado uh, so I mean thank you so much for for being concerned about me. I mean, I, I, that actually really makes me feel good. I just appreciate that so many people care about me. Um, and I, again, I do so much apologize for that. You know, I mean, internet goes out. We, I live in the Midwest, so there's also sometimes weather. I mean, especially in the spring, gosh, we get a lot of crazy weather. So, I mean, it's, it's not an impossibility that 
uh, I, I would have a day where power or internet or something goes out and that would delay why in our chat. It, it don't, I mean, if, it, if it's a day, don't worry too much. If I am gone for a week or two weeks, then be worried. Uh, uh, although uh, I do, for what it's worth, have a plan in place for if anything were to happen to me that I was incapacitated or if I died, um, I do absolutely have, uh, I've left passwords and instructions with someone I know and trust would, would, would follow through with letting you guys know. Um, I would never leave you hanging. I would never abandon my inner chat on purpose. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it'll be, it's, if anything really did happen, you would know, trust me. I mean, I really do care about you guys. I completely consider you guys my friends. You guys are my friends in such a more real way than, than people I see and meet and talk to regularly. Um, so I, I care about you and I would never do that to you. So thank you so much for um, your concern. And it's also on the 11 year anniversary of YNR chat. It, it kind of makes me feel a little bit uh, more special to know that, you know, over the course of 11 years, I've managed to attract other like-minded people who are caring and concerning because I would feel that way too. So um, yeah, I just, I can't thank you enough. Um, Let's get to the comments about the show though. Let's jump off uh, with Gary, who says about Mariah's stalker, well, that is the best use of contemporary culture ever. Tessa comes in and here's the stalker going ape on Mariah and starts taking selfies of him, runs him out of the coffee shop, if not the neighborhood. Well, I love I, I love that idea, Gary, that it's a it's a, a use of contemporary culture because that example I had given previously about Rebecca Schaefer, that happened in the late 80s. So there are, I'm sure, many instances of celebrity stalking that go way before the age of the internet. And it it, it is interesting how the internet in some ways maybe as i said before made it easier for stalkers but this is an instance of using the internet to also fight back it's like citizens fighting back and we see that all over now i mean people photographing things that uh, citizens do that police do i mean that's i hadn't thought of it that way but it's interesting to me that Tessa's first instinct was to take that photo. I don't think that I would have thought of that necessarily, uh, probably because I grew up and remember the age before the internet. I don't carry a cell phone. I don't even have a cell phone. So, or I have a, a I have an old brick phone. Like I don't have a smartphone. So to me, that would never occur to me that someone was in my face or harming me or doing something bad. I everybody has their phone on them all the time, and that never would have occurred uh, to me. It, it, is a function of contemporary culture and in that way I think it's kind of neat that YNR incorporated it. Uh, T. Nicole says, I wonder if the storyline of Mariah's stalker is at an end or if it will still pick up. By making some random guy the stalker, I'm not sure if this is YNR's way of closing off the story because they don't really know where to take it or maybe the random stalker guy is a cover for the real person behind it all. He's being paid maybe to do those things. I still wonder if it is Anna because she made a rude comment to Mariah about Mariah getting what she wanted to hold Tessa back when Tessa told Anna to rip up that contract. What was that about? I can see uh, what she wanted or I'm sorry, I could see why Anna was bothered by Mariah pushing herself into the other business meetings with Tessa, but it seems deeper than that. And for some reason, Anna just does not like Mariah and we don't have as much context as to why. Well, I'm so glad that you said that, T. Nicole, because my first instinct when I noticed that it was a random guy and all Tessa had to do was snap a couple photos to send him away, I thought, oh, Okay, well, is that it then? And then there was nothing after that. Mariah and Tessa literally got up and went to Anna's house. They started talking about <laughs> Tessa's music career immediately after. Like, this guy threw 
threw a brick through the window. He had been texting Mariah and Tesla just shoes him away. They start chitty chatting about her career and then go over to Anna's house as if nothing happened. They don't mention it to the police. They don't do any kind of follow up on it. And I thought to myself, okay, well, is that a wrap up? Cause I hope not. I think there's so much here that we haven't seen before, and that's all I'm asking for you from your YNR is occasionally give me a little something fresh, a little something new. And here is an instance that could be that very much. And you know, as you say, maybe it is just a random stalker and they're choosing to tell the type of story like a celebrity stalking, or maybe it is possible that they're still gonna wind it back around to Elena or Anna. I mean, I, I agree, we still don't understand exactly Anna motivation. We have seen a very stark change in Anna's character and I don't feel like we know why. They're not giving me any context. All they're giving me is Anna putting this pressure on Tessa and this inexplicable rivalry and, and disdain for Mariah. The only other thing I could think of that was mentioned, I think, last week by a YNR chatter is, is it possible that Anna wants Tessa for herself. Is it possible that Anna's fallen in love with Tessa and wants Mariah out of the way and was perhaps doing some of those things to make that happen? I mean, the way Anna was sitting there looking at Tessa like Tessa was giving her her own little private fashion show, that certainly could be the answer. I just don't know. I don't know where YNR is taking it, but I, I hope that they pick up on it next week. Diana says Mariah's stalker is scary. The way he spoke to her at the coffee house was unexpected. I've been wanting to see a stalker type storyline ever since Ravi first appeared. I don't think we've seen the last of this guy. Mariah and Tessa could have, should have called the police. He's obviously dangerous. This could be an interesting storyline as it's different from what we're used to seeing. It's realistic as people on television could have a mentally ill person having delusional thoughts about them. Yes, Diana, exactly. I feel like the fact that they made it this random guy and they were very clear to show that he was unstable. It, to me, that sort of wiped away the theory that it could be Anna or Elena or somebody else, unless that person is skilled at manipulating him. Ugh, yeah, that guy, I don't know. There's no, if, if he just goes away and we don't hear anything more about that, I'm going to be annoyed. Daisy says, Tessa and Mariah should have reported the stalker guy to the police. I seriously doubt he's done. He may even try to get rid of Tessa next, thinking he'll have Mariah all for himself. Yeah. I wonder if he's going to point that little crazy cannon onto Tessa instead of Mariah now. And then um, maybe Mariah will rescue Tessa and further bond them. I, I have to overall say I love that YNR is featuring Mariah and Tessa in a co-supportive kind of way. Well, let's talk about a lighter topic. How about we talk about Tracy and Kane? Kathy says, I have to say, I am enjoying YNR more now than I have in the past few months, though I hate the black and white middle-aged fantasy sequences that Tracy has been indulging in. I don't think I could get on board with the kind of passion she might unleash on Kane. I love Tracy, don't get me wrong. I guess I'd just rather see her with a man of a certain age. Maybe like Jet. Well, you know, Kathy, as I was watching the show this week and we had more of the black and whites, I thought to myself, I can see how some people would not be into this. It's not the greatest. The black and white part is not the greatest, but the romance has me. But you know, there's no wrong answers. I mean, you like what you like. If, if you're not feeling Tracy and Kane, there's lots of other you know potential ways that they could go with this. Part of me wonders if they are actually going to go through with it. It's so unusual. I just almost wonder if Tracy's gonna put this in a box in her mind and choose to not pursue it. We'll find out. Keisha says, okay, the fir at first the thought of Tracy and Kane together made me gag. Being friends, maybe, but a couple, it just wasn't my thing. But 
The way she looks at him, yep, they're going there. That sparkle in Tracy's eye when Kane smiles, it took me back to 1980-something when she was watching Brad Carlton in a blue Speedo cleaning the Abbott pool. <laughs> oh, see, yeah, this is why I waited to do that poll question. I wanted to give a couple weeks, because at first blush, it is kind of like Tracy and Kane, eh, that's a little too off for me. I think people might have knee-jerked said no, but now that we've got a couple weeks on it, I want to see how people are really feeling, and, you know, whichever way you feel is, is no problem, but yeah, I mean, Tracy's no slouch. She has had hot boyfriends before. Brad Carlton, Don Diamant was one of People Magazine's sexiest men, so she's had She's had a pretty good looking guy before, of course she was of his age, she was in his age range then, but I don't know, I feel okay with it. I just, I don't know, I can't think of a reason why Tracy and Kane couldn't fall in love. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, she's got wrinkles, yeah, she's overweight, but so what? You know, love exists in the heart. But, you know, I also understand not necessarily wanting to watch that with your stories, if that's not your thing. Maybe you just like watching young hot people doing doing their thing, or maybe you just don't feel like the chemistry is there. I mean, in any, any way, it's totally fine. I just think it's kind of fabulous that Kane could go from being this man who was married to a supermodel, Lily, uh, to, to going to this plump older woman. I just, I don't know. More cushion for the pushing, as they say. <laughs> I mean, women come into their sexuality uh, later in life, so a man like Kane could really help Tracy and me knock down that door. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned. Oh boy. Yeah, okay, let's 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 check in about Jack here. Diana says Jack was seeming interested in Claire until he found out that Lauren was trying to set him up. I don't know why that should matter if he liked her and her ideas. Good point. It did seem like everything was going well in that conversation, and as soon as he realized it was a setup, he said nope. Nope. T. Nicole says, does Kyle even know that Mia was the one who attacked Lola? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think I missed it. I don't think Lola told Kyle that. And I don't think Kyle is real focused on anything except his relationship to Lola right now. <laughs> Kyle says, I don't think Phyllis's startup is gonna make it very far with that less than impressive web page design. Of course, the source material, Jabot Collective's logo, isn't much better. I really want that graphic design job at YNR. The Society logo is not cutting edge, and that My Beauty ad with Carrie and Jet and Elena's concert poster just looked like high school design projects. Maybe they are rushed or the budget is low, but for the upper echelon, it's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, that website looked bad. I mean, it was way off. To, I mean, and the way that you just launch the website, just the idea that it's like, okay, I've been sitting here and there's one more button I gotta push and then the website's gonna be up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, but I agree. I, I vote that you should be Wyanar's new graphic uh, designer. You should send it, your portfolio to them. <laughs> if I had any influence, I, I would try to use it for you, but I don't. Maybe on my 15 or 20 year Wyanar anniversary, they will gift me a set tour or something. <laughs> You can, and then I'll mention y'all, I'll bring your portfolio with me at that time. Ah, T. Nicole says, it frustrates me that Phyllis is getting angry at Summer for not risking her job at Jabot to help her out. Phyllis would be someone to get angry at her daughter for saying no to peer pressure from her uh, and to act in a non-ethical way in regard to Jabot. Phyllis is a character who acts shady and schemes, but it is a new low to want to drag your daughter into her schemes as well. Yeah, I felt like YNR had, did not do a stellar job of really pulling us into Phyllis's motivation. I understood it a little more this week, but I think there's still some work that needs to be done there. 
Laura says, I find troublemaker women like Mia and Phyllis are more interesting to watch than troublemaker men like Adam and Billy. Hmm. I think I kind of feel similarly, right? Um, Gator Tom, let's talk about these uh, troublemaker men. Gator Tom says, I voted thumbs up for new Adam because I'm excited by having him back and back at an age that's closer to his real age on the show, born in 1995. I like the possibilities. I'm super excited. Ellen says, I wish you were older, but he is giving me a Michael Mooney acting vibe that I like very much. Plus, he stares deeply into Sharon's eyes and didn't want to let go of her hand in the hospital. Yeah, baby. Plus, his bone structure is chiseled from marble me like. <laughs> oh, uh, Sandra voted thumbs up to new Adam because I liked what I saw. I didn't think he overacted and I enjoyed the new Adam's scenes. Having said that, I do wish he were about eight to 10 years young, or older, eight, eight to 10 years older. I do not like the new Adam with Sharon. I mean, no, she's too old for him. Has anyone else noticed Sharon Case seems to have lost weight? As thin as she already is, she looks thinner to me now. I wonder if that's in preparation for some future hot and heavy love scenes with Adam. Oh, I gotta say, I did notice that Sharon's bod was particularly rocking. When she was in Vegas, in bed with Ray, she was definitely showing us some more lingerie. I mean, I'm sure as an actor, that's one of your primary goals. If you're on a soap and you know you're going to have to perform in various states of undress, I'm sure you've got to keep that bod rocking. And if your character is not involved in a sexy, sexy storyline, you might, you know, put on a couple pounds. But if you know that your character is going to be getting it down, you are going to want to look good. She probably takes a whole lot of pride on how her body looks at her age, and she should, too. I didn't exactly notice that she was thinner. I just, uh, I just noticed that she, her body, she looked wonderful. Just wonderful. Not that thin is the only most beautiful thing to see, though. Because there is, you know, I mean, I think that's also why I just... I don't know. I feel connected to Tracy. She's not perfect. She doesn't have the model bod and neither do I. So maybe I just see myself a little bit in her in that way. <clears throat> well, Shelly says, I am pretty sure that Sharon has had more screen time with the current Adam played by Mark Grossman in the last two days than she had with Justin Hartley's in a two year stint as Adam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, that's the thing. There was no Sharon and Justin Hartley's Adam. Uh, and so I think that's why I, ju I jumped off that train and uh, then it seemed like they were picking it chugga chugga choo choo right up with Mark Grossman, but maybe not now. Oh, by the way, Gary says about Faith, how wonderful uh, was Sharon Case in that scene with Faith, truly like a daughter and a loving mother. I'm sure she is really attached to that little girl and she was wonderful in that scene, knowing how to strike the perfect note. I really felt the same when Sharon and Faith ended on that mother-daughter note. It was very beautiful and yes, I'm sure that Sharon Case feels very attached to the actress who plays Faith. I mean, it's not usual that YNR keeps a child actor on and actually lets them grow up on screen. We did see that with um, with Cassie and then they killed her, uh, <laughs> but it, it is unusual. And I think maybe that's why it was so striking to see her again on screen. We had speculated that YNR was going to age the character of Faith, especially since we hadn't seen her a while. And then lo and behold, the actress is there and you felt the chemistry. You felt the chemistry that Sharon Case probably has watched this little girl grow up into the young woman she is today. And I'm sure that this this young woman is looking up at Sharon Case. As, I mean, this is someone she's worked with for years at this point. And it really shone through on screen. And I think that, that really connected me in with those stories this week more than I would have expected. Diana says, I really like the new Adam. He has a cool vibe, and I'm sure he studied Justin Hartley and Michael Mooney's versions of Adam, as he seems to mimic some of their characteristics. Oh, I'm sure he did, yeah. 
Tony says, as a longtime viewer, I don't like rewriting history. Adam is a key character, and tossing new Adam into a new age category doesn't fit, in my opinion. This actor appears younger than the actor who played Noah. Oh yeah, he actually is. Oh, how interesting. So Mark Grossman is younger than Robert Adamson. Oh, I did not know that. Sharita says, in some cases, how a character actually looks is more important than what a type of actor he or she is. It takes me out of the scene to see that drastic age difference with him and the other actors. Oh, Sharita, that is kind of how I was feeling last week. That yes, Mark Grossman seems to embody some Adam-like qualities that he would be able to give us that dark vibe. But it, but it was to me like, oh, he is so young, and it did it did pull me out. You you captured it beautifully. That was a great way to say it. Um, Astra says, I voted thumbs down on New Adam. It's not just his age that bothers me, but I'm not wowed by his acting. Maybe he will grow on me, but as of now, I think he's miscast. Yeah, I'm kind of leaning that way too, Astra, to be honest with you. But we'll, but we'll have to see. Gotta give him a chance. Valerie says, I like the actor playing Adam. Probably because I only started watching YNR for two years now, so I had no attachment to the old Adam. Yes, I'm definitely feeling the actor in this role. Woot woot! Yes, I think that sometimes as fans that have seen the full evolution of a character and the many actors that have played them, it can be a little hard to divorce yourself from the old and commit completely to the new. So I think that's fascinating to hear that someone who only knows the new is enjoying the character. That's great. Gary says, Adam is a dark character and this actor seems to have an even dramatic presence. Eric Braden did an interview that had him stating that all Adams have been well cast, including this one. Who was the chatter, Gary said, who made the great comment on liking both Michael Mooney and Justin Hartley, but ultimately had to see them as two Adams over two actors playing one role? Oh, that's interesting that Eric Braden gives the thumbs up to the new actor. I mean, that matters. That, that you know felt that they've been well cast, especially knowing that I, I'm pretty sure Eric Braden and Michael Mooney did not get along, but uh, he must have still appreciated his acting abilities. But yes, I think it was Ellen who mentioned that last week about feeling that maybe we just need to look at Adams as twins or triplets <laughs> at this point. Uh, and I think that's fair. TB84 says, I am always open to who and what they bring on the show, and then I'll judge later. But so far, yes to new Adam, give him a chance. I know, I agree, I agree. I'm, I'm leaning on a thumbs down still, but I'm, uh, my mind is still open, I promise. Ellen says, the warm reunion between Jack and Adam gave me all the feels. After the cold, cold, cold reception from Nick and Victoria, it was wonderful to see. Adam's siblings are the worst. Back from the dead, whatever. What about me? Is Adam gonna take something from me? Hey Nick, maybe Christian should know his biological father. Face it, head on, work it out. Hey Victoria, maybe Adam deserves your place at Newman Enterprises. Offer him a job. And Billy get therapy. Delia's accident was due to your bad judgment. What a bunch. <laughs> That was a good scene with Jack and Adam, by the way. I, I, I was hoping for some tears. <laughs> I like Jack and Adam. I'm, I'm pulling for more of that. Gator Tom says, I am disappointed that Victoria has in the past forgiven Adam, but now not so much. In fact, what about Billy? Under oath in his court, uh, he, under oath in court, he had forgiveness for Adam. We need to remind these writers that we watch the details. Yeah, I know. I felt that way, too. It just, they, they all were just immediately hostile toward Adam. Immediately. Didn't trust him one bit. When they had all kind of made some peace prior to his going to jail and death. Daisy says, didn't Victoria agree to return to Newman Enterprises if Victor agreed in writing to give her more authority and make her the CEO after he's gone? I forgot how she put it. But Victor agreed. So that would mean that Adam could not step into her shoes without Victor breaking the contract. 
I don't want to see a repeat of this storyline. I thought it was over when she made that deal. Ooh, that is a really good memory. I think you're right. Victoria did make Victor put it in writing that she was supposed to succeed him. Well, you know, Victor always has a loophole, though. Blah. <laughs> Leslie says, Victoria, Nicholas, and their mother always resented Adam, wanting to wish him out of existence. They blamed him and his mother for Victor and Nikki's split at the time and were more than happy to have them go off to Kansas, hoping that was the last they ever heard from Adam. Ooh, that is truth. Truth, Leslie. Mm -hmm. Zuperplex says, what Adam said is true. There is no reason for Paul to suspect that Adam would set this all up. There's no logical explanation. What is it with Paul? Why can't he sympathize with Adam, who's the victim? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I love this theory, though, from Zuperplex, saying, I think it was Esther who shot Adam. How she managed to evade security in order to reach the tech house, I do not know. However, she does have a motive. Another reason for believing it was Esther stems from the fact that Adam was shot only once. If Chloe was the gunman, she undoubtedly would have fired more than once just to be certain she finished the job. The specter of failing to kill Adam the first time would have haunted her and she would do all she could to not make that mistake a second time. If Esther was behind the trigger, she would have made a clumsy job of it, fiddling with the trigger, trying her best to properly operate the firearm. Not surprising given her lack of experience in the field of killer for hire. This explains why the shooter only got off one round and was a bad shot at that. <laughs> oh gosh, can you imagine? Esther with the gun. Wasn't there another instance where Esther had to shoot someone? Wasn't she shooting an ex? A guy that was trying to, that had gotten close to her maybe to get to Mrs. C's money. Didn't Esther fire a, a gun at him? But, I mean, shoot, maybe. We haven't had any other casting notices. I don't think, shoot, I should have uh, checked that here. Um, but I, I don't I don't know. It's possible. It'll be another way to work her onto the show. Mary Ann says, I just saw an article on TV Line, which seems to be covering YNR more, uh, pro more often, probably due to all of the casting comings and goings. Uh, but this article says uh, that Kevin's return uh, should appear, barring no news bulletin bumps, on June 7th and that Kevin may return to the dark side. I also listened to an interview with Christian LeBlanc on the Soap Opera Digest podcast. He discusses his long career, going back to when he debuted on As the World Turns and the first season of In the Heat of the Night, uh, up to his current run on YNR. It does look like we will be seeing more of Michael and Lauren with this current regime. Yay! Ooh, In the Heat of the Night. That is a pull. Um, so June 7th for Kevin, and he's going to be returning to the dark side. I'm curious to know how they are going to fold him in. I did see some rumbling midweek about Chloe coming back, but I, I haven't confirmed that yet. Um, I wonder. I wonder if, Ke if Kevin and Chloe are coming back, and they're just going to be a dangerous duo yet again. And But as with all of these casting updates, I never know if they are temporary or full. Are they bringing these people back full-time with a contract, or are they just on part-time for a little stint? I still don't know that about Melissa Claire Egan. But June 7th was when we can look forward to Kevin returning, and that's not that far away. Oh, let's end on Laura here. Laura says, with the change in Ryder, they bring back old favorites like Paul Davidson, Michelle Stafford, the Adam character, which people have been clamoring for since he left, and maybe Chelsea. Lauren and Michael are back on the scene more often. They sacrifice the amazing Gina Tognoni. These changes are supposed to settle us and bring us and bring back viewers. The thing is, Laura says, the storylines have lost a bit of their speed and vigor. The dialogue between some characters seems like filler. I'm fast forwarding through predictable conversations that I know will not change the direction of the story. Somehow, Adam being shot didn't shock me. Maybe I'm looking for something in between. Loyalty to characters with fast and zippy dialogue and plot twists at every turn. 
Well, uh, to be honest with you, I am having a little bit of trouble too, Laura, adjusting to the new pace. Mal Young was known for the zippy dialogue and the plot twists and turns and, and less for character development. And I was definitely hoping that we would pull the show back to uh, you know, a space somewhere in the, in the middle. The new style of the show is a little bit off for me. I'm not there yet, but I also felt that way when Mal Young took over. So I can't rule out the possibility that I'm gonna get there. I think I'm gonna have to continue to be patient because in theory, like you said, YNR is giving me a lot of things that I should be loving and excited about. So um, I'm gonna have to just keep being patient and hope these new guys find their stride. <laughs> you know, after 26 years of watching YNR and a 11 years of YNR chatting. I am along for this ride no matter what. All right, everybody, it is time for me to go, but you can still chat with me and chat with others over at yrchat.com. That's the website. I love hearing from you throughout the week, so don't be shy there. Everybody's welcome and all opinions are welcome, as long as you keep it, you know, respectful and nice. Uh, and I'm going to be back next Sunday to give you another YNR chat, blazing on through to year 12. <laughs> oh, thank you so much again for being here with me. I really appreciate all of your love and support. You guys definitely help give me the motivation to keep it going. Um, but I also, I think, I just think my YNR experience would feel more dull somehow without my ability to also chat about it. So uh, as, as much as uh, it makes me happy to know that you guys are enjoying it, I enjoy it. You know, I also kind of do it for, for me and to get it off my chest. So <laughs> here I am all this time later. Okay, everyone, have a really good week. I love you.